As Paige mentioned, uh, we're in a series called The Way. If you've been with us, you know what we're talking about. But if you've missed any of these, you can catch up easily with our sermons online. The Way, the title of the series comes from the fact that the earliest Christians in the book of Acts, which is, if you don't know, the story of the birth of the church. Jesus is crucified, resurrected, ascends to heaven, and there's really only 120 or so believers in the world, and they're huddled together waiting for the Spirit. We sang about it a moment ago. The Spirit lit the flame, and the church is born. And the Acts tells that story, the birth of the church and its early growth. And the, these first followers of Jesus, the people in the Greco-Roman world didn't know what to call them because they were unique. They stood out. They were both confusing and compelling, and so they referred to them as people of the way over and over again. Sometimes it was just a pejorative term, sometimes a term of curiosity, but we're exploring, well, what does it mean to be people of the way today, to live the way of Jesus in our day? And we began two weeks ago looking at the, the way of Jesus. In John chapter 14, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We looked at what that means. And last week, we looked at the way of self-denial from Luke chapter nine, when Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, meaning live this way, he, she must deny themselves. Take up your cross and follow me. And we said that deny yourself doesn't mean like deny yourself chocolate or practicing self-discipline. It means to deny yourself, that part of you that wants to have its way. So you can't follow the way of Jesus and the way of yourself at the same time. And today we come to, as Paige mentioned, the way of abiding. From John chapter 15. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. So I, we're gonna do something a little different. We don't always do this, but I want you to stand and hear this text read over you. Let's stand up for the reading of God's word. John 15, verses one through 11. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may be, bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. Thanks be to God for his word. You may be seated. I don't know, did you notice a theme in those 11 verses? Anybody notice a word or a phrase that was repeated? Like you had to be sleep standing to, not to catch this one. Sometimes in our preaching team, we get together and we wrestle through, what's the heart of this text? I mean, there's lots of things that we could say, but what's the primary thing God wants to say to his people through this passage? But in this passage, you have to be like, you have to be like somewhere else mentally not to hear it. Did you catch it? Say it. Abide. <laughs> 10 times in 11 verses, Jesus says, abide in me and I abide in you. So whatever that means, it's pretty important. Whatever it means to abide, that seems to be the thing we ought to talk about, and we will this morning. What is it to abide? What is he talking about there? First, a little, a little background. Where was Jesus when he said this, and who was he speaking to when he said this? Well, John 14 closes with these words. Jesus says, let us rise and go from this place. John 13 is the washing of the disciples' feet. It's the Last Supper. He's speaking to them in John 14, and then in John 15, we, we read about the vine and the branches. So they rose and went from this place, meaning the, last, the upper room, the Last Supper. In John 18, it, they, it we're told that Jesus and his disciples crossed the Kidron Valley and arrived on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you all know what happens there. If you don't, Jesus is arrested there and taken away to be crucified. So 15, 16, and 17 are conversations Jesus has with his disciples while walking from the Last Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane. You could walk from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives in about 30, 35 minutes. I've done that, actually. But presumably, they're not going in a hurry. 
Jesus has some things to say to his disciples, and I think he has some things to say to us as well. On the way, after dinner, less than 24 hours before his crucifixion, he says these words to them about abiding in him. The first thing he says is, I am the true vine. This might sound obvious, but Jesus is the true vine because he says so. This, by the way, is the last of seven I am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John. You might be familiar with this, but in the, through the Gospel of John from chapter six onward to this statement, there are these seven I am statements. He says things like, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We looked about that two weeks ago. And here, I am the true vine. Now you might be thinking, well, he's just using metaphors like he did from agriculture that helped him make his point. He's doing something more than that that we could miss if we're not careful. Look at John 15, verses one and, and verse five again. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is doing something really important here. So in the Old Testament, the image of vineyards and vines, not, not the clothing line, but uh, the, that image was used to refer to God's people, Israel. Israel, the people of the children of God, they were the vine that he meant to plant and cultivate that would bear fruit for the blessing of the world. But they didn't. They were a, a wild vine, sometimes referred to, a fruitless vine, a vine that did not bear fruit that he intended. He plants them, he cultivates them, he tends them, and they, because of their rebellion and sin and disobedience, don't bear fruit. Let me a couple of references here. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 21. Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy a pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate to become a wild vine? In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. So God plants Israel, his people. It's a metaphor for cultivating them, tending them, wanting his justice and righteousness to be manifest in the way that they live, but they don't measure up. And so when the disciples, these, are, these 12 men are Jews who have come to see Jesus as the true Messiah, when they hear vine and vineyard talk, they know what's coming. Oh, oh. This is a story about how we've always messed up. This is a story about how we have not been what God intended. But think about what Jesus says in that context. He says, I am the true vine. What's he saying? He's saying, I am what you could not be. I will do what you could not do. I know that your, the history of your people and your own life has been faithless and fruitless, but I've got you. I am the vine in me. I don't know if, you, if we grasp the good news of that simple statement, how shocking it would have been to them. He's the vine fulfilling all the things that God intended in himself. So if Jesus is the vine, the source of life, the energy, the nourishment, the nutrients that gives life, what are we? Class? Branches, right? I'm not going to ask you any trick questions, right? Branches. It's all right there in the text, right? We're the branches. So if we are the branches, then our only job is to abide. Like, you know, you have one job, right? Abide. What does that mean for us to abide? Our job and our role as branches is simply to stay connected to the vine. I have here a, a, a branch. Actually has fruit on it. Lest you think this is plastic fruit, I'll prove it to you. This is from the... Aqua Viva Vineyard, the grapes are still there. Well, they, they have seeds in them. <laughs> anyway. Joey Brandonicio cut this for me and brought, I brought me one last night. I used it as an illustration in the sermon and this morning, totally withered, which I think is a spiritual lesson we'll get to in a minute. A branch of the vine bearing fruit. We'll talk about that in just a minute, what that means for us. You are branches. You don't have to produce anything. You don't have to prove your worth. You can't, anyway. You don't have to measure up. You don't have to earn anything. All you have to do is to abide. Now, the Greek word for abide is the word meno. 
literally meaning to stay or to remain. Makes sense, doesn't it? Stay connected. Remain connected to the source of life. This is foundationally important for people who would follow the way. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, we have this tendency, I do, to hear the word abide, and it's important. It's repeated over and over again, abide, abide, abide. And we, we automatically, in our minds, go, okay, tell me what I must do to abide. Give me the 10 steps to abiding. Give me the six principles of abiding. Give me the five keys, right? Give me the book, I'll do the stuff. But even that impulse is missing the point. The, abiding is not all the things you do to prove your worth. It's stay connected to Jesus. Remain with him. It's, it's, like, it's like we want to run off and do stuff, right? Jesus, I feel this impulse. I wanna, I've got things to accomplish. And Jesus is saying, yeah, yeah, come back here. Stay with me. But Jesus, there's, I understand. I know about that. Stay connected to me. But I've got, like, how many of you have, when you had children were little, they didn't stay with you very well? Anybody? My youngest son, Benjamin, was terrible at abiding when he was a toddler, right? He, he, was, uh, he would run. We were, in the, we were in Ecuador one time with, with our whole family on a missions trip. I was leading high school students, and we're in the Andes Mountains. We're on a fire pit with a bunch of high school students. My wife, my other, older two kids are there, and my four-year-old son, Benjamin, disappears into the mountains in, in Ecuador at night. You know, <laughs> what's out there? You could hear his voice. I'm over here, Dad. Like, where is he? You know? He wasn't, abide with your mother, right? You know? in, in a way, I think we want to run off and do stuff. And Jesus is saying, would you just stay with me? Stay connected to me. Now remember, he's 24 hours from going to the cross. This is pretty important stuff for those who would follow him. And what are they going to do? They're going to scatter. He's saying to us, whatever comes, stay connected, remain with me. There's so many profound statements in this passage of Jesus. But I, I think if if I had to pick one verse that is the heart of what he's saying, it's verse nine. I think this, this verse is simple, it's short, but it, it's as deeper than any ocean of the world. Listen to what Jesus says and think deeply about what he's trying to communicate to his disciples and to us. As the Father has loved me, well, here we go. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Pause there for a minute. God the Son is talking about the fa God the Father's love, Trinitarian love. How does the Father love the Son? Think about that for a minute. How would you characterize it? Perfectly, unconditionally, almost beyond comprehension. Remember what Jesus, the, the voice of the Father says about, over Jesus when John the Baptist brings him out of the water at his baptism in the Jordan River? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus says, that is exactly how I love you. So abide in my love. Pause for a minute. Have you ever felt the voice of God Speak to your soul. You're my beloved daughter. I'm proud of you. I'm pleased with you. I love you. Those of you that are climbing the corporate ladder, working hard, trying to accomplish something with your life and your talents and your time, have you ever felt God say, you're my beloved son. I'm pleased with you. I love you. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's almost uncomfortable to sit with that, isn't it? It's it, Jesus saying to his disciples, I love you perfectly, completely. It's beyond your comprehension. Would you just stay there and watch what I'll do? And watch what I will do. If you will remain in my love, I'll handle it. Yes, there'll be things you will do, but out of that place of abiding in his love. I think in a way, this verse is like the whole key to living the Jesus way. 
Paul, if you read his prayers in the, in the New Testament letters, over and over again, he's not praying for the Ephesians or the Philippians or the Colossians' circumstances, occasionally. But most often, his prayers are that they would know the depth of God's love for them in Christ Jesus. Like, that's the most important thing. Whatever circumstances you're facing. This is how Jesus loves you. I, I, I think... When, when you have, a, you think you've offended someone or they've offended you, years ago, my neighbor, when we lived in a different house, um, we had our, he, he would drop off things on our porch that like about the ordinance, city ordinances for how late a dog could bark. We had a dog who did bark late. It's a very kind gesture of him, you know? And then we just had a little tension. I didn't, I didn't his name was Ray. I didn't, I didn't want to, uh, I wanted to love Ray, but Ray made it difficult and there was just tension. So sometimes I found myself avoiding, like I see Ray outside, I'm not getting the mail now, right? Ray's out there, right? I don't want to hear it, you know? Do you ever do that? If you have somebody against, something against somebody, maybe there's something in the past that's not been resolved or you just, you think that they think something of you and so you find yourself sort of subconsciously avoiding where they are, eye contact. Is that, you know, we do this with God, don't we? We do this with God. And I think, in a sense, what Jesus is saying is, if you're in Christ Jesus, you have no reason ever to avoid him. Why would you ever avoid him? He is always inviting you to abide in his love. Why would you avoid him? He's certainly not avoiding you. He loves you. It's so easy for us, though, to become disconnected from this, like branches cut off. So, three results of abiding. Not requirements, results. If we abide in Jesus, if we remain in his love, as he's asked us to and told us to and invites us to, then he, three things out of this text that he says will happen, we should expect. Now, let me pause before we get into these and just say, if you're a Christian, that is, you have turned over your life to Jesus, received his grace and forgiveness, and decided you want to live his way. You know that you have no hope without him, that he's redeemed you and forgiven you. That doesn't mean you live perfectly, but it means that's your central, fundamental identity. Then these three promises are for you. If you're not, maybe you know about Jesus, you're exploring this whole thing, then these three results or promises are an invitation to you to place your trust in him. Okay, number one, it'll be obvious, but it's important to say it, bear fruit. If we abide, we will bear fruit. There's a progression in the text. It goes from no fruit, those, those branches don't bear fruit, he takes away, to fruit, to pruning for more fruit, to much fruit. Did you hear the progression? No fruit, fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Like that's what God wants for us, to be more and more fruitful. We have to talk about what fruit is in just a minute. But according to Jesus, to be a Christian means to bear fruit. If there is no spiritual fruit at all, then there's no sign of spiritual life. It's the whole point of the analogy he's making here. It, so fruit doesn't make you a Christian, it proves that you are one, that you belong to him. You don't produce fruit to prove or to earn, you bear fruit. You know the difference between producing and bearing? I never got this until I read a little book by Warren Wiersbe called On Being a Servant of God. There's a chapter on producing versus bearing. Vines produce, branches bear. What does it mean to bear fruit? What does it mean? It means fruit just hangs there. I didn't make it happen, but it's there for the world to see. The vine produces fruit. The branches bear it. What this means is your life is meant to be like a display rack for the goodness of God in you and through you. You're bearing what he's doing, showing it off for his glory. Let them see your good works and praise your Father who is in heaven. John 15, verses four through five and verse eight. Whoop, go back one second. That's a good picture. I forgot about that. Look, at that's Joey Brandonicio, the, uh, the godfather of the vines, I call him. <laughs> anyway, I went out there and he, and he walked me around and showed me how uh, every branch, w w they know exactly where to trim it back and prune it. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, you can see the vines. The vines are going straight down from him. Those branches coming out along the trellis there are bearing fruit. But apart from the vine, they got nothing. What's gonna happen to this? Tomorrow morning, I can tell you, I already had this experiment. Brown, withered, 
Grapes will become rotten. We'll eat them on Monday or Tuesday because there's no life left. Looks like it right now, but there's no connection to the vine. Okay, John 15, verses four through five and verse eight. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Imagine this branch trying to bear, produce fruit. You know, just, <laughs> right? Nothing. Jesus says you have really one job. So according to Jesus, we will bear fruit, but what's fruit? Well, three things uh, that, uh, that Pastor Tony Evans says about fruit that I heard years ago and have stuck with me. He says about the characteristic of fruit. Fruit always reflects the, its source, the, the character and the nature of the tree or vine from which it comes. You don't find oranges on an apple tree, in other words. There are different kinds of hybrids and grapes, and they're, they're, they're bearing the fruit, which reflects the character and nature of the vine from which they come. So the fruit in our lives is meant to bear the character and nature of the one who is the vine. And who's that? So whatever fruit is, it's reflecting the character and nature of Jesus. Second, fruit's always visible. No such thing as invisible fruit. Like if you go apple picking, I used to love doing this, but now I just like to buy the apples. And see. When my kids were little, it was fun, but now I'm like, eh, I don't know, walk around. And, but whatever. If you go apple picking this fall, good, good for you. And I hope you have a great time. And you walk down, look for the trees, right? And uh, I want the apple cider donuts, so you can pick me up a bag if you do. <laughs> and, but do you, do you stop at the trees that have no apples? Let's pick from this one, honey. Maybe it has invisible fruit. No, fruit's always seen. So in our lives, fruit would be seen on display. In the way we treat each other, the way we, our speech, our life, our behavior, our decisions. And third, fruit is not for itself. Like fruit, fruit doesn't eat itself. That's rotten fruit. Fruits for someone else's enjoyment and nourishment. Think about that in our lives. So spiritual fruit reflects the character of the vine, Jesus. It's seen by others. It's for others' good and God's glory. Probably the best place to get a list of what the fruit is, what it looks like, is in Galatians chapter five. Some of you will know this passage where the apostle Paul calls this the fruit of the spirit. Not fruits, but fruit, one fruit. Here's what he says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. What does that mean? I, don't think, I think what he means is nobody hears this listening and goes, uh-uh, no patience for me, thank you. No kindness for me. Like everybody, who doesn't want to be a more kind, loving, patient person? But can you make yourself become patient? You ever tried? I'm gonna be patient today, patient. I'm gonna be so, so patient, patient, patient. What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna be super kind. You can do and say loving things. You can give a kind gesture, but we are powerless to produce that deep character on our own, <laughs> apart from the vine. So you cannot produce fruit yourself but if you abide, he will do it. And then he says, we should expect pruning. Expect to be pruned. If you're abiding in Christ, you can expect that you will be pruned. John 15, verse two. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. That it may bear more fruit. Pruning is a good thing. It's a necessary thing. But it's not something that I think we always enjoy. Because it means to be cut back. Years ago, on a Saturday morning, I was out in my yard. I think it was like late spring after we had these lilac bushes and they just bloomed and I was trying to prune them, but I didn't really know what I was doing. Anyway, I was in my yard doing yard work and this old rusty truck pulls up in front of my house and this, this man gets out. He had big bushy eyebrows, wearing overalls, kind of bow legs. He comes walking up to me and he had an Eastern European accent. He's like, who, who cut, who cut tree, who cut? I'm like, I, I, I did. He's like, what? No, this wrong. He shakes his finger like, you did it wrong. He grabs my hand. I'm like, okay. And walks me around the yard. He points out like what I did wrong. You must put, door, you must cover. And, I, like, and my wife's looking out the window like, what? I'm like, I don't know. He's like, <laughs> apparently he's like the, the, the tree whisperer. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> We're walking around, he showed me like what I should do differently for like a half an hour. And then he said I, he would do it all for $600. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I wish somebody would walk me around my own soul, my own life and say, we need to trim this back. This needs to be cut out. This is preventing growth. This is for your good. That's exactly what Jesus says the Father does. He's the vine dresser. When I was talking to Joey about the vines, he said they know exactly after, after harvest season where to cut them back so that, so that they will produce more fruit. He actually said, so new life will grow. <laughs> Apparently Jesus knew what he was talking about. What happens to a branch left unpruned? Tangled, overgrown, less fruit, eventually it won't produce anything. It's for your good. It's a measure of, your, of God's love for you that he would trim you, cut you back. Now, let me just, not every hard thing in your life is God pruning. Not every tragedy or difficult circumstances. Sometimes things happen in our life that are hard because we're stupid and sinful. Sometimes you do dumb things and you pay for it. That may not necessarily be God pruning you, although he can use that if you're listening. Sometimes we live in a broken world and sometimes bad things just happen. And God can use that if we're listening. But now and then, I think God in his mercy and love does bring things into our life to prune us, to trim us back. The temptation is to think that I'm doing something wrong or he doesn't love me. Here's how the writer of Hebrews puts it in chapter 12, verses five through six. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons, as daughters? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when he would prove by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So if you're feeling in a season of being cut back, pruned, and it hurts a little bit, and you're wondering where God is in it, I just would offer you this. It doesn't mean necessarily you're doing something wrong spiritually. And it doesn't mean God has stopped loving you or paying attention to you. It might actually be evidence of his loving hand in your life, if you'll trust him. We can trust the vine dresser. He prunes so that we will bear more fruit, become more like him. Think back over your life for just a minute. Over the times when you've grown most spiritually, have they been the times when it was all smooth sailing? Comfortable, easy, up and to the right? Have those been the times in your life when you've experienced the most spiritual growth? Not for me. They've been the painful times, the hard times, the difficult times. Jesus is the vine, his father is the vine dresser. So stay connected to the vine and trust the vine dresser. And the third thing he says we can expect if we abide is we'll experience joy. The end result of abiding in Christ is God's glory and our joy. I love how this passage ends. Let me read verses 9 through 11 for us again. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Let me pause there. Praise God that verse 9 comes before verse 10. Because you could take verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, and make that some rule, and you'll stop abiding. Like, I have to obey, I have to obey. Our obedience comes out of the fact that, verse nine, abide in my love. Out of that place, I'll lead you into obedience. Then verse 11. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. That my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. Do you think of Jesus as a joyful person? Or do you think of him as like serious and super spiritual and serious all the time. I think Jesus was full of deep joy. And he says that my joy, my deep well unending of joy would be in you and in that you would have full joy, fullness of joy. Not circumstantial happiness that comes and goes, but a deep and abiding joy. The, the, here's how the, the psalmist puts it in Psalm 16 verse 11, one of my favorite portions of the Psalms. You make known to me the path of life. We're talking about the way, right? In your presence there is what? 
fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In the presence of God, Jesus says, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. You're in my presence if you belong to me. And there's fullness of joy there. And in my right hand, the right hand of the Father, are pleasures forevermore. We tend to think of that, well, someday in heaven, no, right now, being held out to you and to me if we abide, are pleasures forevermore. Fullness of joy. So, abiding in the love of Jesus, delighting in the fruit of Jesus, believing in the words of Jesus, he says, if my words abide in you, Trusting in the pruning of Jesus will result in sharing in the joy of Jesus. I love the way Peter expresses this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You ever, you ever try to express to somebody, you have those moments, those just indescribable moments with God. They're fleeting, but we have them. It's hard to put them into words, isn't it? They're just beyond what we can capture. The sense of being loved by God. I'll finish with this question before we give you a chance to abide a bit. We're all abiding somewhere. There's a place in your life where you, you remain, you stay, you dwell. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your own head, right? We're all abiding somewhere. And I think for most of us, we occasionally visit the love of God in Christ, but we're abiding somewhere else. I think the invitation to the disciples and to us is, abide in me. And then visit your job and all the other things in your life. But let the place where you live and dwell be my love, my deep and unending and unconquerable love for you. Remember, Jesus is walking to the garden where he's going to be betrayed and then go to his death. How good and tender and kind is he to say to those of, who are his followers and to us? Like, what's his heart? His heart isn't about, it's for us. As the Father has loved me, so do I love you. Abide in my love. I'm gonna invite you now after I pray, we're gonna listen to a song. And I know that... Um, it can be uncomfortable to feel loved by God. But I'm gonna invite you, while you listen to this song, sung over you, to let God speak the words of his love for you. And then I'll come up and I'll lead us through the communion elements. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the true vine. And we are just branches. And the only thing you ask of us is to remain in you and you will produce fruit. And yes, sometimes you'll prune us back, but it will be for our good, your glory, and ultimately our joy. Why would we avoid you? Why would we run from you? Here in this moment, Lord, help us to remain, to stay present, to abide in your love. We give you all the praise and glory. Amen. As you peel off that first layer, hold the bread in your hands. And I want to remind you that you don't have to be a member of Chapel Street Church to come to the Lord's table. You simply need to know the Lord Jesus as your forgiver and your savior and your healer. If that's true of you, he welcomes you at his table. On the night of his death, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he passed it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body. It's given for you, the body of Christ, the bread of life. Eat this in his memory. In Luke's gospel, Jesus says that he eagerly desired to eat this meal and drink of the fruit of the vine with his disciples. And he tells us that every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he returns. We proclaim the truth of his love for us. Drink this and remember him.
Lord Jesus, we thank you for giving us what we don't deserve, what we could never earn, the forgiveness of our sins, the hope of eternity with you, and life abiding in your presence and love even now. As the song we heard says, we are the branches, you are the vine. Teach us to abide. We pray this in your name. Amen. Will you stand with me for the benediction? I'll leave you with Jesus' words from John 15, verse 9. As God the Father loves God the Son, so does the Son love you. Go and abide in his love. Amen.